How are you guys? Good to see you on a Wednesday night. It's good to be in church. If we haven't met before, my name is Garrett. I uh, serve on staff here at the church as a pastor, but also the director of our leadership college, which, by the way, we're enrolling right now for fourth quarter. Just thought I'd throw it out there, cottonwoodcollege.org. But it's good to be with you. Hey, since the last time I spoke on a Wednesday night, this happened right here. Boom. Yeah. Yep, our little bundle of joy, literally she's a bundle right there. I think we got a second photo of her. Ah, one of my favorites. This is Layla Lou Cedarholm. She is stealing our hearts and our sleep all at one time and looking very darn cute doing it. And she's lucky she's cute at three in the morning, let me tell you. Uh, but you know what, on the day she was born, it was this overwhelming emotional thing for me, as a lot of fathers told me to expect. But what I didn't expect is that now, five weeks later, the feelings for her are actually getting stronger. And every time I talk to parents about this, they're like, it only increases. And I'm like, my heart's going to explode. I can't handle this. And of course, as many parents say, now that I have a child, I'm beginning to understand more how God loves me. But what more so I'm beginning to understand is how much God actually wants me to love him. This is something that I'm learning through this experience of, of had, having my daughter Layla, and that's a perfect segue into our theme this month. We're studying Psalm 119, and the book of Psalms is amazing because it's filled with all kinds of uh, affectionate language for God, devotional language. You can read the book of Psalms and just learn to love God just by reading the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms is actually unique to any other book in the Bible, and it's part of a genre. It's, it's actually a, a book of poetry. I don't know if you know this, but it's, it's a little bit different than other books of the Bible because uh, other books in the Bible kind of take you sometimes through like a linear progressive thought that unfolds and kind of gives you information that leads to an ultimate end. And the Psalms aren't really like that. In fact, um, to sort of help you understand this, uh, in the last few years, my wife and I have been down to the California Science Center. I don't know if you've ever been there down in L.A. Super cool place if you like science, if you like all things science, uh, which I kind of do. But for every exhibit... In, at the California Science Center, there's some long thing that you can read or some long video that you can watch that'll like give you all the information on what it is that you're looking at or the exhibit that you're experiencing, which by the way, they've got the Space Shuttle Endeavor there. You need to get down there and see it. It's super cool. You will totally geek out just by walking underneath it like that thing was in, in the universe, as I like to say. It was in outer space, which is nuts. But all throughout the, the California Science Center, there's all kinds of information that you can download. But the Psalms aren't like that. Certain books in the Bible are. The Psalms are more like walking into an art gallery where you see pictures and images and statues that want to touch you emotionally, sometimes spiritually. And they want to make an impression on you and teach you things, but teach you things in a different way. And I like to step into our passage tonight with that idea in mind. And we're going to be looking at verses 90, starting at verses 97, Psalm 119. If you're not there, please turn there. And I want to read to you the first set of verses that we'll be looking at. In verse 97, it says this. You could read with me. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself has have taught me. Verse 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. I want you to notice something in these eight verses, if you didn't already, and that is that there is this really affectionate language that the psalmist uses about God's word and ultimately about God himself. Look at verse 97. He starts and says, oh, how I love your law. He says in verse 98, your commands are always with me. 102, I have not departed from your laws. And then verse 103 gets like really mushy. And he says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. This 
heavy, affectionate language. It's almost romantic. And this is a little foreign to us because this language uh, conveys such an intimate affection for God's word. And here's the truth, that in God's word, we find God. So the psalmist's affection here for God's word is an affection for God himself. And this language can be a little bit foreign to us. We don't often talk about the word of God this way. Like, I can't wait to read my Bible because it's sweeter than honey. Or it tastes better than n- n- Nutella. Or whatever it is you like. I don't, that's the first thing that came to my head. But we don't often talk about God's word this way. And it, that language can feel a little bit foreign. And I wonder if maybe it feels foreign because we don't always see or understand or acknowledge how deeply we actually need God. Like, at the end of the day, we're pretty needy people. But the problem with us is not our neediness, it's actually our fallenness. It's the sin problem, because our neediness was meant to point us to God. But it's our fallenness that sends us to other places trying to fill the neediness that only God can fill. Because Just as much as we need, or I should say the amount that we need, is the amount that God is actually willing to give himself to us. It's a perfect fit. Our neediness meets with the giving of God in a phenomenal way. God so loved the world that he gave his son for us. And our ultimate need was his son, and he gave that to us. And as much as we need is as much as God is willing to give to us. And if we could begin to acknowledge that neediness and recognize that Like in other places when the psalmist says like my soul uh, longs for God or just as the deer pants for water so my soul longs for God. Like he's stating a truth about us that our soul is always in this needy state and we desperately need God on a regular basis. And then when you begin to see that then you understand why the psalmist says your word is sweeter than honey to me. Because you realize that it's his word that satisfies the neediness and it makes it so sweet and so good for your heart and so good for your soul. But I digress because although these eight verses use this affectionate language, that language continues in the next 32 verses, but there's a bit of a different angle on things. There's a bit of a different movement in the way the psalmist talks about his relationship with God's word and with God himself. I'd like to give you a preview, they're gonna put it up on the screen, of a few verses that we're going to go over. And look at how the language changes a little bit. Psalm 119 and 116 says, sustain me God, according to your promise and I will live. Do not let my hopes be dashed. Verse 120 says, my flesh trembles in fear of you. I stand in awe of your laws. 122 says, my eyes fail looking for your salvation, looking for your righteous promise. It is time for you to act, Lord, he says, and your, your, your law is being broken in 126. I love that, a bit demanding. 132, turn to me and have mercy on me, as you always do to those who love your name. These verses, and more that we will look at in a moment, sort of change how the psalmist talks about his relationship with God. So what does all this mean? Well, it means that Although we're to love God, that in our relationship with God, there's a give and take that can happen. There's sort of a back and forth movement that, that can take place between us and God. And we're, that, that ultimately leans to the idea that we're allowed to ask questions, we're allowed to fail, we're allowed to be human. And this back and forth, back and forth movement reminds me of something. It reminds me of a dance. And I want to suggest to you that our relationship with God is like an invitation to a dance. If you've ever seen uh, couples that dance together, they're gonna put a few photos up to help you visualize this, or maybe you dance yourself, you'll notice that there is this back and forth movement or this side to side movement. Don't I look good doing that? You're gonna see a lot more of that. Uh, yeah, so get ready. You came to church tonight. But in, in dancing, there's this back and forth movement and what is needed in a couple's dance or when two people dance, is that they need to get into a rhythm together to form a relationship. And I think this is what God is inviting us into, getting into a rhythm with him, getting into a rhythm that he's leading us into. But oftentimes, we don't approach or see our relationship with God this way. A lot of times, we tend to see our relationship with God kind of like a ticket taker at a movie theater, where we are sort of having a transaction with God. I don't know about you, 
But when I go to the movies and I go to buy my tickets from the guy at the booth and then I hand my ticket to the guy at the kiosk, like that's as far as our relationship goes. I tell you what movie I want. I don't ask a whole lot about your life. You, tell, you give me the ticket, I give you the money, you give me the ticket. I walk in, the guy at the kiosk, I hand my ticket to him and he points me in the right direction. And for the most part, that's as far as our relationship goes. It's a transactional relationship. If we're not careful, we can start to approach our relationship with God sort of in a way like moving from one transaction, one transaction to the next. Where we come to God, we have a need, we have a want, we need him to point us in the right direction. And so we come to him and he does it. Then we don't talk to him anymore for a while until we have a need and a want or we need some direction. We come back to him and it becomes this sort of stale, cold, stagnant thing like you and the guy at the ticket booth. And that's not at all, I don't think, what God had in mind from the beginning of time when he decided to create man and have a relationship with man. He wanted us and still wants us to come and dance with him, to come and move with him. You're going to see some of my, my rhythm. I have no rhythm. But this is why we read later in Scripture that it's in God we live and move and have our being. That there's this rhythm we can find with God. That we don't just have a stagnant, cold, transactional type of relationship with him. But we begin to dance with him. We begin to move with him. And there's give and take. And there's per permission. He gives us permission to be ourselves. He, per he gives us permission to be human. He gives us space to fail. Space to ask questions. Space to have doubts in the midst of our trusting him. It's okay to have some doubts, friend. That's part of the dance. I want to talk more about that. And what I want to do is highlight from our passages that we're studying in Psalm 119, three dances. The dance of commitment, the dance of hope and reverence, and the dance of expectation. Dance of commitment, the, the dance of hope and reverence, and the dance of expectation. And the whole point of our dance with God is intimacy. That's what he's after. And he invites us into this, and each part of the dance that we're going to talk about is a way for us to start to get into a better rhythm or get into the right rhythm with God. So we can, we can begin to move with him and begin to know him and uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, be connected to him and create a relationship through the right rhythms. Let's talk about the dance of commitment. Look at verse 105. We'll read the next eight verses together. He says this, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it. And I will follow your righteous laws. I've suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are a heritage forever. They're the joy of my heart. Look at 112. My heart is set he says, my heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. What I want to do is just highlight a couple verses out of those eight verses. Look at 105 and 106. He says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We've heard that verse before. But look what he says in 106. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't go around taking oaths. So that word oath, is a bit foreign to us. It's not really a modern word or a thing that we do, but in the ancient world, this is a sacred thing. If you were making an oath, this was serious business. This is a commitment you were bound to. And in, in effect, the psalmist is saying, I have bound myself under the authority of God's law, which means I bound myself under the authority of God himself. In other words, the psalmist is saying, I'm all in, God. And in verse 112, he says, my heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. And this is the first part of the rhythm of the dance that we're invited into. We've got to be all in in this dance. God has to have our hearts completely. It's really hard to dance with someone when they're not really like totally motivated to dance with you. Try it. You will very quickly get very frustrated and they won't have the right rhythm and, and, and in turn you will fall out of rhythm and you will not be able to create 
what dancing with a partner is supposed to create, a, a relationship that is in rhythm. So the first thing is, is we have to be all in. And I want to say something to you on that note. God doesn't need perfection, but he does need our surrender. I want to say that again. God doesn't need our perfection. He doesn't need perfection from us, but for the dance to work, for our relationship with him to work, for us to get into the right rhythm with him, he does need a surrender of every part of our life, surrender of our hearts, and a surrender of every room of our house, sort of speak. I recently, a few weeks ago, met with a couple in my office, and uh, they were excited to meet with me. They wanted me to marry them. And uh, they began to tell me that basically they had been living together. And uh, God, like the Holy Spirit, just totally convicted them about the lifestyle that they were living. Ha living together, not being married. They were obviously physically intimate. And they shut down that physical intimacy. And they said, we're not doing it until we get married. But we love each other. And we've got a future together. Will you marry, marry us? And I, I thought, this is so cool. And they began to share with me about their background and kind of both of them came out of these messy relationships. And in the mess of it all, in the imperfection of it all, they were willing to right there say, we before God are wanting to take a step into rhythm with God and say, we will surrender this area of our life to him. And it, we're not perfect, but we're here to surrender. We're not perfect, but we're really to lay down this part of our life and start to walk in step with God. And God is looking down going, I've got all kinds of space for you to be imperfect. I got all kinds of space for you to move around in this dance. Please come and dance with me. And their answer was, yes, Lord, we will surrender. It was amazing. A few weeks later, I married them in my office. And they brought some friends, and God really breathed on that moment for them. And you could just see their faces light up. This was a new rhythm in their life, in their surrender to God. So I just want to ask you a question. Are you all in? <laughs> Someone is back there. God hears you. Pretty sure the people down the street do. <laughs> no, thank you. We need to be all in. It doesn't mean perfection, but it does mean surrender. The second dance I want to talk to you about is the dance of hope and reverence. Let's look at the next eight verses for a moment, starting in verse 113. Psalmist says this, I hate double-minded people, but I love your law. You are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. Away from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commands of God. Sustain me, my God, according to your promise, and I will live. Do not let my hopes be dashed, he says. Uphold me, and I will be delivered. I will always have regard for your decrees. You reject all who stray from your decrees, for their delusions come to nothing. All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross. Therefore, I love your statutes. My flesh trembles. In fear of you, I stand in awe of your laws. Let me stop right there, and I want to highlight again a couple of verses out of, this, out of these eight verses. We're 114, look at it. He says, you are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope, he said, my hope in your word. Verse 116, he says, sustain me, my God, according to your promise, and I will live. Do not let my hopes be dashed. Do not let my hopes be crushed, in other words. 117, uphold me. And I will be delivered. I will always, though, listen to this, I will always have regard for your decrees, or I always will respect what you say, the psalmist says. And I'd like to suggest to you that these verses introduce another rhythm in this dance with God. The psalmist in these verses, first of all, offers up his hope in life in kind of a vulnerable way. He says, and, and really this is an extension of the first part of the dance, which is I'm all in, because if we're all in, certainly... God can have our hopes, our dreams, and our desires in our future. We could place them in the hands of God. And the psalmist does this. He says, my hope is in your word. However, what we see is that in this rhythm of giving God our hopes, giving God our desires, giving him our futures, that in that rhythm, there is a little bit of room for us to be concerned about it. Because the psalmist is concerned about it. He says, do not let my hopes be dashed. Do not let my hopes be crushed. In other words, don't let me down, God. Like, I'm out here, God, trusting you here with the things that matter most to me, the most important things in my life, God. I'm trusting you, and I'm hoping that's not a mistake. But I do trust you. 
But I'm hoping it's not a mistake. And in this rhythm of giving our hopes and desires for God to God, there's room to have some concerns sometimes, to have some doubts sometimes. But you got to stay in the dance and bring your hopes to him, bring your concerns to him, bring your questions to him. And God says, that's okay. Come and dance with me. Come and stick with me. I'll walk with you through this. I know you've got questions. I know you've got concerns. I know you, you, you're thinking about the things that matter most to you, and you're not sure how it's going to work out, but just stay. Just keep dancing with me. Just keep moving. <laughs> that was bad. The dance we're invited into allows room for us to be human. Several years ago, I went through what I would say is the most difficult thing I ever had to go through in my life. And to be honest with you, uh, I was devastated. There's no other way to say it. And there was a large part of me that was kind of angry at God and had a lot of questions and didn't understand in looking at where I was at. First of all, how did I get here? And why is it then I look around, I see blessing in other people's life in this area, and yet my life is falling apart in this area. And I didn't get it. And there was a part of me that was very frustrated with God, and I let him know. I, I, I knew I, I, if I'm in this dance, then I'm going to dance, God. And I'm going to take, I'm going to allow, I'm going to take advantage of the space you're giving me to move with you, okay? But simultaneously, I was also saying in the midst of having concerns and questions and doubts and even fears, I was simultaneously saying, God, I absolutely trust you. I absolutely know that you're going to take care of me. I absolutely know that you see me, that you haven't left me alone in this. And sometimes I think we think that we have to give up our concerns, give up our fears, give up our doubts about things sometimes in order to trust God. And God's saying to be human is to sometimes have both at the same time. And that's okay. And the Psalms and Psalm 119 and the verses we read invite us to have this kind of relationship with God where we can be real, where we can be authentic, where we can, you know, sometimes push back a little bit and go, what's up, God? I'm out here trusting you. Verse 17, 117, though, look at it. He says, uphold me, and I will be delivered. I will always have regard for your decrees. Or in other words, I will always respect what you say, God. This is what I want to tell you is that not only do we need to give God our hopes and desires and dreams, we must, to enter into the right rhythm with God, we must have a constant uh, recycling reverence and respect for him all the time. For giving God's our hopes and desires, we've got to land in a place of reverence. This means, listen, this is a tough one. This means we constantly say, God, your, be your way is better than my way. And this is when the dance gets tough. This is when the dance, when it's like, I need to take a break and get a drink of water. <laughs> because I don't know about all that. I don't, I don't know about, uh, I don't know how to trust you. And also believe that your way is better than my way. But God keeps saying to us, you, if, if the dance is going to work, you've got to have a reverence. We've got to have a respect. And the psalmist understands that. He says, I will always uphold your, your decrees. I will always regard them. I will always reverence him. In the midst of my questioning, in the midst of my doubting, at the end of the day, I'm going to respect what you say, God. And we've got to get to this place. I was blessed enough growing up, I'm so grateful, to have an amazing father. He was a loving father, always made time for me, was such an example to me. He was full of integrity. I always knew I could trust my dad. And even at, when I became a teenager and began to talk back to him, begin to blatantly disobey him, keep secrets from him, there's stuff that he still doesn't know that I did. But all the while, there was something secretly in me that had this reverence and respect for him. And part of it was because he was just my dad, and that's the way you're supposed to do it with dads, but, but the other part of it was he was really good and he was really trustworthy. And I knew I could trust him and I had this, this healthy fear of him. And I want to say to you that everyone in this room is invited into a dance with a heavenly father that is really, really good and full of all kinds of integrity. And you can absolutely trust him. So he's leading the dance. He's inviting you to come and live with him, move with him, breathe with him. And you could believe that he's good and you could trust that he's good. And at the end of the day, you can have a healthy fear and respect and reverence for God and his word. It's a thing that we need to do to get into the right rhythm with him. Hope and reverence is an important part of our rhythm 
in this dance with God. The next dance I want to talk to you about is the dance of expectation. The dance of expectation. Let's look at the next set of verses. Verse 121. Let's read them together. I have done what is righteous and just. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Ensure your servants' well-being. Do not let the arrogant oppress me. My eyes fail looking for your salvation, looking for the, your righteous promise. Deal with your servant according to your love and teach me your decrees. I am your servant. Give me discernment that I may understand your statutes. It is time for you to act, Lord. I love that. Your law is being broken because I love your commands more than gold, more than pure gold. And because I consider all your precepts right, I hate every wrong path. Let me highlight a couple verses out of that for you. Look at 122. Ensure your servant's well-being. He's talking about himself. Do not let the arrogant oppress me. This is a request. Look at 123. My eyes fail. What is he saying? I'm super tired because I'm looking for your salvation, looking for your righteous promise. How many can relate to that? Like, I'm tired of waiting, God. Verse 126, it is time for you to act, Lord. So bold. Your law is being broken. I love that God gives room for the psalmist here to, to have some audacity with him. And although there's reverence and respect, the psalmist can say, hey, like, it's time, God. Days have gone by. Weeks have gone by. Months have gone by. Years, in some cases, have gone by. It's time, God. I'm looking at my $5 Casio right here. And I can tell you that it's time for you to act, Lord. Serious, $6, Amazon.com. Check it out. <laughs> But there's this rhythm of expectation that we need to get into where we uh, have enough of a relationship with God that we would move with him and be in relationship with him enough where sometimes, as I said earlier, we get to push back a little and there's enough grace for that and there's enough room for that. And really though, although many of us have felt this way, I just want you to know that it's important to understand that this dance with God is not a one-sided thing. There's a back and a forth. There's a give and a take. But here's the thing. This rhythm of expectation requires that we don't just ask if we are getting what we want, but we ask if God is getting what he wants. And that's where the rhythm of expectation gets a little tough. We get to say our piece. We get to be bold. But at the end of the day, if we're going to slip into a rhythm of expectation then it's not just what we're expecting, it's is God getting what he expects from us. We can't just expect God to change our circumstances without also recognizing that he is expecting to change us from the inside out. He is leading the dance, and there's an agenda that he has in this dance. There's an agenda for intimacy, but there's an ultimate end. There's a place he's taking us. There's things he wants to do in us. But we have got to ask the question, is God getting what he wants? So as you've already seen, I'm a pretty terrible dancer. The funny thing is my immediate family thinks I'm a, a really good dancer, but that's because they're like far worse than me. <laughs> so if they're like way down here, like I'm one notch above them, and they're in awe, and I keep letting them think that I'm a really good dancer when I'm not. But a few years ago when my wife and I were dating, we went out with a few friends from church here to this place where we were going to supposedly learn how to salsa dance. I have no idea what I was thinking. But we go to this place and we're out on the floor and there's someone up on this little stage and, and they're walking through the steps, right? So they start in step one and it, for me it felt like 10 seconds later he was in step two. And I'm still back here going, like, I'm, I'm just trying to do this right here. And I look up again, and he's on step three and four. And everybody else is, like, getting into this rhythm of salsa. And as you can see, I don't know what the salsa rhythm looks like at all. This is all I know how to do, so I just stay right here. But basically, I just left. We left. I said, I can't do this, Julie. And she didn't care. She was in love. And so <laughs> we just left. She's like, you don't have to be a good dancer. Look at you. No. I was saying that. Like, let's get out of here. But we left, and here's, here's the funny thing about that. Like, I wanted to learn how to salsa dance without learning how to salsa dance, which is not possible. Because I was expecting to walk in there and something to, like, take over my body. I was just going to start, like, 
turn into a salsa dancing machine. I had this vision. But what I didn't understand is that the person on the stage was expecting me to submit to a process, submit to a process of transformation. And if I was going to learn to dance with them, then I would have to go, okay, I'm committed. I'm all in. I'm going to walk through the steps of learning how to salsa dance. But I didn't do that. And in, our, in this sort of divine dance with God, although God gives us permission and a lot of room and a lot of grace, because it's a graceful dance, it's full of rhythms of grace, but at the same time, he's expecting to do some stuff in us. And it's, it's not enough just to, to say, I trust you, Lord, but can we do this my way? Can you just zap me? Can you just change me now? Turn me into a salsa dancing machine so I can impress my wife-to-be. I don't even know if we were engaged by them. But anyway, uh, that didn't happen. And in the, God wants to move with us, right? He wants, he wants to live with us and be with us. And at some point, he stops in the middle of the dance and he grabs us by the shoulder. And he's like, see that thing in your heart? I want to change that. There's some, there's some things in your character that need to change. So before I change that circumstance, let me change you. Let me get all up in your business. Let me turn you into a dancing machine. <laughs> the dance of expectation. There is an agenda that God has. He's the one leading. And because he's such a good father, because he's full of integrity, we can trust where he's leading us. And we can trust. See, God, we need to get so far into the dance that we don't even notice when he's changing things about us that we didn't ever think he would be able to change. That's how far into the dance we need to get. That's how committed to the dance we need to get to where all of a sudden we're in this rhythm, we're in this flow, and people begin to say, you know what, you're different than you were a year ago. I've been dancing. Thank you for noticing. I work out. <laughs> But he has this agenda, and he knows where he's taking us. Look at the next set of verses, which is actually the last set of verses. You guys got me sweating up here. <laughs> Goodness. 129. Your statutes are wonderful, he says. Therefore, I obey them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant, longing for your commands. Turn to me and have mercy on me as you always do to those who love your name. Direct my footsteps, excuse me, according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Redeem me from human oppression that I may obey your precepts. Make your face shine on your servant and teach me your decrees. Streams, let's look at 136. Streams of tears, the psalmist said, flow down from my eyes for your law is not obeyed. You can stop there. I don't know if you noticed, but in this set of verses, we're basically ba right back where we started. At the beginning, in those first eight verses, they have all kinds of affectionate language about God. Because the dance starts with intimacy and love, and it ends with intimacy and love. But really, 136, that verse is the epitome of where God is trying to get us in this dance. The psalmist says, streams of tears flow from my eyes. I'm broken and crying basically, because your law is not obeyed. And whether he's talking about other people or his own life, it doesn't matter. The point is, he's gotten so far into the dance that he's gotten the heart of the person he's dancing with. Yeah. Yeah. That he understands what the dance is all about. He understands that the rhythm is leading to this place where God can sort of send us off on our own with his heart, dancing by ourselves. Now, seeing the world the way he sees it, seeing people the way he sees it, this is God's agenda for the dance. Our heart becoming one with God's heart, where we break and cry over the things that make him cry. This is God getting what he expects from the dance and in the dance. We actually begin to think like God thinks and see like God sees Love like God loves. Why? Because we were committed to the dance. We gave our hopes to God. We uh, uh, dance with expectation, both our own expectation and realizing God has an expectation. But no matter what, we stay in the dance. 
and we keep moving with him and we stop turning him into a, a clinical transaction God that we just come to when we need something. And I have got my money, God, or I, I need this blessing in my life. And he's saying, I'll bless you. I'll bless you even if you don't want more than that. But what he does want more than that, he wants us to dance with him. He wants us to get into a rhythm with him. Here's the crazy thing about all this. And I think I'm kind of closing now. But here's the crazy thing about all this. We are created to dance with God. How do I know this? Well, in Genesis 1.26, the Bible says that when he created man and woman, when God created man and woman, he created them in the image of God to be like God and to be in intimate relationship with God. So we were created to dance. We were created to live in step and in rhythm with God. This is the thing we were built for. This is the thing we were designed for. But something happened along the way and we left the dance. And this is the thing that breaks God, God's heart is we begin to dance with other things. We begin to dance with other people. We begin to give our affection and our love to other things and fall in step into the wrong rhythm. And so when we read the psalmist who says his words are sweeter than honey, we go, what does that mean? Because our taste buds have changed and our rhythm has changed and we've lost the right rhythm that we were meant to have from the beginning. But there's such good news about this because we have a Savior, Jesus, that actually came to restore our ability to dance with God again. Can I, if I can have a keyboardist come up, that would be fantastic because I'm getting ready to close. But this is what Jesus came to do to bring us back into step with God. To, to take on flesh is what God did in Jesus and be fully human and fully God at the same time to teach us that we can be a human being that bears the image of God, that's human in all the respects of being human, but dances with God in a perfect way. And Jesus came to restore this. And I don't know, maybe you're in here tonight and you can honestly say, like, I've never, I've never thought about entering this kind of relationship with God, where there's space for me to move, where there's grace for me to fail, where there's grace for me to ask questions, where I have permission to have some time to get in step, to get in rhythm, to start to move with God in the right way. Maybe you walked in here tonight and you're like, I don't even, that's so foreign to me, because you've always seen God like the guy at the movie theater taking your ticket, and you talk to him every now and again, and you ask for a blessing, you've got a need, you've got, you got a want, and he always shows up, but then you don't talk to him again. And all the while, he's saying to you, will you come and dance with me? The Bible tells a story that in the beginning, God created a really good world, and he created really good human beings. That was his plan from the beginning. And sin and selfishness ruined everything. God said, I don't like what I see, but he dispatched a plan. And, and his plan stemmed from this. He fiercely loves his creation. He fiercely loves us. He, he is massively committed to dancing with us, massively committed to getting out onto the dance floor, getting to know us, getting into rhythm with us. Like he's more committed to us. He loves us more than we could ever get our heads around, than we could ever fathom. As excited as you've ever gotten about God, he's always been more excited about you. Yeah. 